So hi everyone and uh, welcome to this particular video which goes through uh, the start of our discussion on the random effects model. And uh, in the past uh, two videos, we've been discussing uh, the fixed effects and the first differences model. And the key behind the fixed effects and the first differences model is that we assume, okay, for the most part that the covariance between the unobserved heterogeneity term and our regressors are not equal to zero. That is, our regressors are somewhat uh, correlated to uh, the unobserved heterogeneity, that space-specific heterogeneity that is there. Right? So we know that that is probably the case in most of the th of things that we do in panel data, such that uh, in a way that, well, we pretty much use the fixed effects model and um, the first difference model as standard. However, there are certain cases in which that covariance term might actually be equal to zero, or at least quite insignificant to begin with, right? So, well, if that's, uh, uh, again, we typically use those cases uh, with the fixed effects and the first differences because of that endogeneity issue between unobserved heterogeneity and the independent variables. However, we do not necessarily need to use fixed effects or first differences when the covariance term is equal to zero. So when that covariance term is equal to zero, what we will show in this particular video is first, you can use pooled OLS or fixed effects or first differences. That will be fine, actually. Those will give you consistent estimates. But actually, those are two extreme of solutions, right? So they're not the most efficient solutions, right? And that's basically what the random effects will be doing. It's a way to make it a very um, uh, efficient solution, right? So why would, first, first question to ask is, why wouldn't we have to deal with the alpha i term in some cases? Well, sometimes the panel model we, which we may have specified could have the following characteristics. For one, the dependent variable, uh, the way we modeled it in terms of the regression model that we have, you might actually be specifying it quite well, right? So you might have control for all the factors in determining the dependent variable. So it would be okay for you to say, assume that that alpha i x i should not be, the correlation of that should be equal to zero. Or it could just be that that alpha i is just very insignificant or very small, such that it doesn't affect your estimation at all. So can we just use OLS, right? The answer actually is yes, right? You can even use, again, the fixed effects model and the first differences model, and all of these estimators will be consistent, as I alluded to. Now, why, while well, you can use it, okay, what are some reasons why you might want to avoid using it? Okay, well, it turns out that the fixed effects model and the first differences model are too extreme in these cases. For one, we know that the first differences model, it will throw away a period, right? You have to difference, right, between the present and the past period. So you automatically throw away the first period in your in your data set, right? So that's kind of terrible, right? Especially if you don't have a time problem to deal with. The second one is, well, if you use a fixed effects, you're estimating too many things that are generally unnecessary. Like for example, if you implement a fixed effects using a least square dummy variable, then you're estimating so many dummy variables that uh, by your construction mean nothing, right? So all of these are sort of insignificant things. Right? Now you can use OLS and the problem with OLS is actually OLS will perform the best out of the three, but you may suffer from serially correlated errors. And essentially, the random effects is a way for you to correct the serially correlated errors. That's that's all that it is, right? It's a way for you to correct the serially correlated errors. And how it, you, you, you would remember if we have a composite error term, and uh, say you want to calculate the covariance between a to i t, a to i t minus one, right? This is just equal to covariance alpha i, u i t, alpha i plus u i t minus one, and then you do the procedure, right? You can potentially get, okay, uh, you, you will get actually uh, a variance that is positive, right? So there could be 
uh, positive uh, serially correlated errors with one another, right? So that's the that's the case. So you'll have serially correlated errors to some extent still in your model. So, and this is where we lead into the random effects model. To it, the random effects model is basically a correction to that serially correlated errors problem. And it uses the implementation of a feasible generalized least squares, right? And uh, a feasible GLS, remember, it's used to cure a lot of problems, typically like heterosexuality, serial correlation, things like that. In the context of panel data, when we do it on the serially correlated errors, it's what we refer to as the random effects model. And uh, to explain this better, consider our um, model below, right? The one that we've been discussing throughout the past few videos. Uh, if that co if that covariance is equal to zero, as we mentioned that, then it means that the first difference is the OLS term, the fixed effects term would not be the most efficient model to use. Instead, the random effects model would probably serve us best. And uh, the way the random effects model works is it introduces what we call a partial demeaning factor, which is lambda. So you'll see lambdas all around. And what it does is it's basically a fixed effects model, but we sort of scale the mean okay, to an extent, right? It, that's why it's a partial D. Okay, so notice here, okay, so this is how the random effects model works. Notice that if we have lambda is equal to zero, essentially we're dealing with pooled OLS, right? Pooled OLS for the very simple reason that if this was equal to zero, this cancels out. This is just going to be one. This cancels out and this cancels out. So you're going to be left with a pooled OLS model. If lambda were equal to one, right, then what we're going to have now is a fixed effects model, right? This is equal to one. So this is the pure mean. This is going to be also um, uh, uh, the this beta naught would cancel out. And then you have the pure mean here. And then uh, this one, the alpha i term will cancel out. You're only going to, this will be a the i t minus a the i t minus one uh, bar. Okay, so you're going to have the fixed effects model. Okay, fixed model. So what we're going to have here basically is the lambda is actually a generalization, right? So we can get both the fixed effects and the pooled OLS model through the random effects model, actually, right? But uh, what has been shown is that, well, actually, in most cases, okay, when that covariance is equal to zero, that lambda is between zero and one, which gives rise to something in the random effects model. So that's what we have. So how exactly is that formulated? Well, we have this element, lambda. Lambda is equal to one minus sigma squared u, sigma squared u, plus t uh, divided by sigma squared u plus t sigma squared a. Now, the key question is, what are those sigmas? Well, these are the variances. Okay, These are the variances of the alpha i and u i t error terms. Right. So those are the variances of the alpha i and UIT error terms, and they basically govern everything in the random effects model because that lambda governs everything. So uh, these are, again, the variances, and if that lambda is equal to zero, then it's only possible if that sigma squared u is equal to zero. Therefore, RE is equivalent to the pooled OLS. And in essence, right, the effect of alpha i is effectively unimportant without considering the serial correlation issue. If lambda is equal to one, then it's only possible if that thing blows up to infinity, right? And if that blows up to infinity, then it must mean that there must be some confounding factor in alpha i. So we need to account for it, right? And you, the way you account for it is through fixed effects. And in essence, the random effects is a quasi time demean model since we didn't fully demean it like a, like a fixed effects only partially. Uh, the caveat being, well, you, we know that, that it's an intuitive formula and that it involves these variances, but we don't know these variances in actuality, right? These are unobserved. So what we do is we estimate it using lambda hat, right? And we basically get sigma u squared hat, sigma alpha squared uh, hat, uh, and then that allows us to estimate lambda hat, right? So that's what we do. 
So how is random effects done? Random effects is basically an estimation of lambda hat, right? Again, lambda governs everything, but you don't know sigma squared u and sigma squared a in actuality. So best you can do is, well, let's just estimate lambda hat, okay? So step one, we use a fixed effects or a pooled OLS to estimate lambda hat, right? Then you use lambda hat to estimate the original random effects equation. In estimating, we just use pooled OLS on this transform system. And this two-step process is generally the random effects model. So always this two-step procedure, use pooled, effect, or pooled or fixed effects to estimate the lambda hat, then plug in the lambda hat to the original random effects equation and move on, right? Now, an important question now to ask is, well, how do you compare between the models that we've had so far? Well, now we want to see, okay, does the random effects actually perform better than the pooled OLS? And one test to do that is the Bruch pagan test. And uh, how do we determine whether the RE or the pooled OLS is better? Well, we can use the Bruch pagan test. And in essence, we what we want to show is, okay, it tests the null hypothesis that lambda is equal to zero. Again, if lambda is equal to zero, then that's basically pooled OLS. And if the alternative is true, then lambda is not equal to zero. That's um, basically a support for the run effects, right? So that's the Bruch Pagan test, right? That's that. Now, there is a need sometimes to account for time constant variables in a random effects model. So consider this formulation below. You have average income, green space, and climate. Climate is a non-time varying thing. It's just with respect to I, right? The way you operationalize the RE, we partially time demean this using our estimated lambda hat, right? So again, you have the lambdas and then you're estimating it, okay? But remember that climate is equal to climate I bar because it is fixed through time. But we know that in general, that's uh, between zero and one. And these terms will not disappear like in a fixed effects. Therefore, RE will give us actually the ability to account for time constant variables, which would have otherwise been dropped in a fixed effects. So in effect, you can use a random effects and account for these time uh, constant uh, uh, variables, which again, when you use first differences or fixed effects, those would have been dropped from your model outright. Lastly is, well, how do we compare random effects and fixed effects? Uh, consider the model below. We know that if that covariance term is equal to zero, then both RE and FE will be consistent, but the standard error of the fixed effects will be higher than the random effects simply because you're estimating so many other things that are unnecessary. Therefore, it would be best for us to use random effects. Uh, the converse is true, right? If that is not equal to zero, that is the unobserved heterogeneity has some relationship with the regressors, right? And uh, essentially what we want to test directly is this hypothesis, this covariance versus this covariance, whether that covariance term is equal to zero and not zero. And this is what the Hausman test will do. And the Hausman test uses a W statistic, which takes this particular form. The test statistics is essentially a chi-squared with one degree of freedom. And uh, if the null hypothesis is true, then it means that RE and FE are both internally consistent, but it appears that RE is more efficient, right? Because uh, again, for the reasons we stated earlier, and if the null hypothesis is false, then it means that that covariance term is not equal to zero, right? So. Um, that's basically it for the random effects model. Again, as you can see, it's just an efficiency correction compared to pooled OLS or uh, fixed effects or first differences, a way for us to get uh, those uh, estimates much more efficiently and to deal with the serial correlation problem if you would just opt to use a pooled OLS. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.